Uh, hi everybody. First, like to mess with your brain a little bit with languages. Today we are switching back to English. Uh, and thanks for resisting the chaleur uh, or the heat. Um, this will be the last talk. And we will talk about uh, WebAssembly and what actually will be the next features. Because we will see that what we have right now is just an MVP. Uh, before starting, uh, a quick note on myself. Um, I'm Italian. Uh, my name is Elia, I'm a software engineer here at Dailymotion, where I work on the video player and the, the, the streaming logic client side. So, uh, as I said, uh, what most of the people think about it when talking about WebAssembly right now is actually just the MVP. And it's something, it's a set of features that shipped around in, two, in 2017. And uh, that was based on an idea like uh, Vladimir already explained it, but I will go very quickly on that. Uh, it was based on the idea that a tool called MScript and Broad that was about compiling C and C++ code to SMJS. Then people said, okay, it's very cool that we can compile to SMJS. Browsers, engines, they did whatever they could to optimize it as much as they could. But still, I mean, it was not native performance. And so the cool thing that they wanted to achieve was to get a tool to compile any code to an agnostic compile target uh, for a virtual machine that can hypothetically run everywhere and in the browser too. So this compile target, it's WASM, WebAssembly in general, and um, it was built on three main principles. Uh, the first is that it has to be fast, and it has to be fast in terms of execution. So when your WebAssembly apps runs, when your code runs in the browser, it has to run as almost native performance. And it has to be fast to load, because the difference between running something on the browser and running something on an installed application is that you have to download the code first. So it has to be a, a compact uh, compilation target. Then uh, with this format, we, they wanted to take advantage of all the browser security stuff, uh, which is positive, because like uh, the browser is a sandboxed environment, and so it's um, guarantees a, leave, uh, um, a level of, of security to third-party applications that you don't have if you just install them. They can access your machine level code and whatever. Uh, and this is especially important when we talk about memory management. We already did that. Um, so WebAssembly has this linear memory management to communicate with JavaScript, and that's it. So that was the MVP. That's what we actually talked about till now. And uh, the question and the point of the talk is that if this was the final version, and especially if this is feature complete, so does it have everything we need? Uh, as you can imagine, otherwise the talk ends here. Uh, the answer is not. Uh, the current version of the standard that we have, it works very well for some applications, but it's still not enough for many others. Uh, so uh, the community needs more. And the, the WebAssembly working group is working on many, many new features, which are actually either under testing or under uh, future implementations. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the entire WebAssembly design specification is available on GitHub. It's open source. So you can go at this link and check actually what the standard is. And as it is, the roadmap and the, the current status for the future features. So that's directly for how the the file looks right now, like there are like many stuff going on, as you see on the right, that goes a little bit fast and laggy, but uh, some stuff it's already in implementation phase or feature proposal, whatever, but you can keep track of all of them and it's a living standard. Um, so, uh, talking about feature proposals, um, feature proposals are handled by the WebAssembly working group, which is, its mission as this note states, is to standardize assays and load time efficient format uh, execution environment, allowing compilation to the web with consistent behavior across a variety of implementations. Um, as we already said in the first talk, uh, WebAssembly Working Group follows a W3C process. And before uh, telling to you, showing to you all the list of new stuff coming, I want quickly to go and show you um, how the group works, because maybe you came up with a great idea for WebAssembly, you want to contribute, it's, it's actually quite easy. Uh, so the first step, uh, it's the pre-proposal phase. So it's very easy. On the design uh, repo, you can open an issue with an idea. 
So if after this talk you say, fuck, it would be cool to have this, just type something down. And then it will, it will trigger a discussion with people from the working group, other people interested in WebAssembly or whatever. And if the issue you opened, yeah, the ideas you opened, it's actually worth some more specifications, some more work, the feature will be moved to the feature, the, the idea will be moved to the feature proposal step, which is just about creating a new repository, a fork of the WebAssembly design, and start to implement the, write down a POC of the specification of the new feature. Um, after a proposed um, text is available, um, the, the feature will start to be implemented um, by browsers or whatever embedders could be interested in it. And as soon as the feature is implemented by WebAssembly, the group says at least two browsers, but I mean, it's kind of flexible. Um, so at least we have, as soon as we have some implementation working, the, the working group will start to standardize the features, and when they reach finally some consensus, and you know that in web standards it can take ages, but whatever, uh, the feature will be standardized. Cool. So now we know more or less how it works, and we can dive deeper in all the stuff that is coming out. So the first group of features uh, which are going to ship to WebAssembly are focused on runtime performance. So it's everything that will allow WebAssembly to take advantage of uh, the powerful machine that most of us have, because there's a lot of, of like uh, power in our computers that's actually not fully used by, by, by the web browser right now. And uh, talking about this, the first, it's multi-threading. Uh, I bet most of you know that JavaScript is single-threaded if we don't take into account web workers and all that stuff. And for as fast as it is, most of, right now, even WebAssembly is single-threaded. So it will share the same thread as JavaScript can off and will have a lot of limitation because of that. Um, so this proposal is to allow uh, WebAssembly to have um, direct access to threads. And um, good news in terms of implementation because the proposed spec is already available and many browsers started already to implement the feature. Um, it actually already, it's already shipped in Chromium. So um, uh, one of the latest versions of V8 uh, sh uh, shipped the support for the WebAssembly threads. Uh, it's under heavy development and kind of available in WebKit and Firefox, en Firefox Engine 2. But it's disabled because I don't know if you know, uh, in this browser, the shared array buffer that we mentioned sometimes in talks before, it's disabled. It actually opens to some like vulnerabilities due for the spectre issue that was discovered uh, half a year ago, kind of. Uh, but you can still test them by using a feature flag. Uh, so now the presentation kind of lags, so I think this pizza is uh, So I think this video will not prove anything, but a nice project that was finally ported to the web a couple of weeks ago. It's Google Earth. I don't know if, whatever. Uh, you all know it. Um, uh, before that, it was possible to run Google Earth in, in browsers, but it was using some Google Chrome proprietary uh, stuff. Now it's like full compliant with any browsers, and especially on Chrome, it can run using the thread. So let's see. Yeah, you see. Why, why is it on the left? Like, ideally, it's, it's way from there. Uh, you have the link, whatever, you can check it out with your machine without Zoom. Uh, um, and plus, there's an article where people from the Google Google Earth team, they explain a little bit how they do that, and it's really interesting. And yeah, the big, the big performance jumps when you can use Red is actually that you don't slow, don't slow down UI updates if you do heavy computation, like a software like Google Earth does. Uh, other cool stuff, it's, uh, for example, that some people <laughs> decided to, to recompile the entire Vim um, editor and put it uh, to work in the browser as a WebAssembly app. And um, this shows you, for example, it's a good example to, to make you see how this is affected by the shared array buffer stuff, and it will hint you how you can test it on Firefox and Safari too. Plus, um, I, I put on the slide, like most of the slide is actually links and stuff that you should have to check after because otherwise it takes four hours to do this presentation. Um, the guy who did this Vim stuff, uh, wrote a very explanatory uh, readme where it actually shows how we architecture the entire app. 
So if you're interested, it's a good thing. Plus, there's an article in Japanese that really explains it even better, but that's off limits a little. Uh, second thing in performance is support for SIMD. That stands for single instruction multiple data. That's another form of parallelism that allows you to run like uh, concurrently your script on multiple chunks of data at the same time. Uh, the status for this is a little bit more blurry, still in feature proposals, some browsers are already starting to implement it. And if you got a little bit confused like I have been when I started to check this stuff, like about what was the first point multi-threading and what's that parallelism, um, think it as it is, if, if the green bar is, the, is your memory, concurrency is, uh, thread concurrency is just that you have multiple parts of your program doing different studs and at, uh, at the same time and accessing the same memory kind of. While data parallelism, you can see as like your, your JavaScript or WebAssembly script gets like duplicated doing exactly the same stuff at the same time and touching only different parts of the memory. Imagine that if in memory you have an array, for example, and you have a very big array and you want to double all the values, you can have the same stuff doing on chunks of like 10 values at the same time. Okay, uh, let's think for performance, it's 64-bit addressing. Uh, I guess not so much to say on that, just that if you remove all the artificial limitations, so you, if you want uh, to write WebAssembly apps that hypothetically have uh, petabytes of memory to access, maybe in the future our, our client-side application will go way over the, the megabytes that we ship right now, so they play safe. Um, so that's a pre-proposal on these two. Um, Firefox actually, Firefox has some like good plans to implement it, uh, while other browser is still kind of blurry. Uh, another thing, which is Web WebAssembly feature feature will allow us to do, and it's very cool. It's high language features, um, and it's stuff that you will need if you want to work on project like uh, rewriting uh, JS frameworks in some other languages, or um, making some compiled to JS languages. I don't know if some of you is familiar with Scala JS, for example, it's like Scala compiled to JS. We actually compile them to WebAssembly. In order to do this amazing stuff, um, you, you, we need some stuff on WebAssembly too, um, which high-level high languages most, uh, most of the time have. Garbage collection, uh, exception handling, uh, debugging, take calls, whatever. Um, I focus a little bit on garbage collector. Um, right now, WebAssembly doesn't directly have an access to the browser garbage collector. Like, you can free the memory, allocate memory, but you don't have access to the garbage collector, and that's a big difference. Um, and, uh, and this is useful, why? Well, imagine that, for example, um, you decide to rewrite React in Rust, <laughs> because, I mean, you have a lot of free time, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so every framework which has a virtual DOM has a different algorithm to understand how to update, whatever. You decide to rewrite it in Rust, gain a lot of uh, uh, performance uh, uh, because like, you will be able to do it like concurrently with uh, static type checkings and all this stuff. The problem is that stuff like that, w the, the, the boundaries between the WebAssembly memories and the JES one at every different iterations. It's kind of blurry right now. And you will lose probably most of your optimization due to the fact that the browser doesn't have any idea how to clean up the memory. That's why like garbage collection will allow these kind of weird projects to come in the next years. So looking forward. And two happened, we actually need two things. One, it's like a JavaScript specifications for typed objects. So JavaScript languages will need to have a way to declare how an object is structured. Right now it's not possible. Like a kind of TypeScript thing, imagine. Like a kind of a TypeScript interface built in JS. And what I said, the WebAssembly internal support for garbage collection. Exception handling. Uh, uh, many languages, JavaScript too, have exceptions, throwing errors, all the stuff. Uh, right now, uh, WebAssembly doesn't have um, an, a proper way to handle with exceptions. Uh, you can do it, there's a polyfill which is heavy and will make you lose kind of all the benefit of using WebAssembly or so whatever. Um, so by default it's disabled. 
but uh, even if you enable the polyfill, there are still some edge cases right now that you cannot handle. For example, we say that um, JS code can call WebAssembly code, but the other way around works too. So your WebAssembly code can call some JavaScript code. And if that JavaScript code does uh, undefined, is not an object, well, all this shit, uh, then it will throw an exception and WebAssembly will have no way to handle it properly. And so this will come, there's like a specification in progress, like everything. Uh, let's think debugging. Uh, we all like to, with one of our skills as front-end developers, being able to open like the Chrome or Firefox Dev tools and use all this amazing thing, source maps and whatever. There's something like this for WebAssembly already, but actually you cannot really see your source code that, uh, in, in like your native language at runtime. You can point it at some kind, uh, in the, at, uh, you can still like access the, the compiled WASM file from the, um, from the browser at runtime, but it's not the same thing, whatever. So we want to support something similar on WebAssembly 2, and this too, there's a proposal, and it's coming in the future. Uh, last part, it's about load time, means like how much time the, the, um, it takes from the moment when the, the, your browser request that wasn't filed for, to the moment when the browser is actually running the application, okay? Uh, and you, if you are wondering why, um, why it's that even needed, like since actually it's requesting a file and parsing it and running it, like don't we do that already for JavaScript? is that uh, actually WebAssembly uh, opens to another kind of applications, another mindset, um, which is like huge applications. Um, you will see uh, Google Earth will have now, like it has a quite long loading uh, before launching. AutoCAD, it's something like 100 megabytes, I think, some, if you load everything. Same, this is like Zen Garden, it's like 125 megabytes, so it takes ages. So load time is important. Um, why we have such um, not perf so much performant load time in WebAssembly right now is that um, another thing is that, as we said already, WebAssembly allows you to have predictable performance. So you know that that's the speed you will get. And in order to get that, it's because the code is compiled ahead of time. It's not like JavaScript that gets interpreted and gets re-optimized by the just-in-time compiler and whatever. Uh, all the compilation for, for WebAssembly happens at the before uh, the app starts. So if you ship 100 megabytes, well, it's not 100 megabytes on, of WebAssembly, whatever, but you can imagine. Uh, so one thing that it's very cool, and it's improving this a lot, it's streaming compilation. And it's about compiling a WebAssembly file while the file is still being downloaded. Uh, so that's what happens right now if you don't have streaming compilations. Um, Actually, it's not that a, web, a file on the, on the web, it's one thing that gets delivered. It gets delivered into chunks. So what happens is this, nice laggy animation. Uh, this, this, and this. Now the browser has your entire file. Pass it to the WebAssembly compiler, which compiles it to some like very fast code that can run immediately. The point is that before you had to wait for the entire file to be downloaded, why this is not what WebAssembly was built for? Because one very cool thing of WebAssembly was in format is that it can literally be compiled line by line. So as soon as you get one line, you can compile it. That's why streaming compilation works like this. As soon as the first chunk is delivered to the browser, it will already be passed to the compiler, and the compiler will already start to build some machine code. And the more chunks get delivered, uh, the application uh, gets compiled, and by the time uh, the, the file is downloaded, most of the time you will already, already have a compiled version in your browsers. Uh, that's because support is already good for many modern browsers. Um, it's shipped in both Chromium and uh, Firefox. I couldn't find info on WebKit, like uh, many, many times, whatever. Um, so, especially in uh, the article that I linked about Firefox shows how the um, WebAssembly compilation now on Firefox is that fast that by the time the file is downloaded, the compilation is done. So you, you don't lose time. Another thing is tiered compilation. So it's having one, uh, more than one compiler um, compiling the WebAssembly code at the same time, kind of. Uh, it's easier to explain with a nice diagram again. So we had this before. 
And the, the kind of bottleneck sometimes for the WebAssembly apps is the, the compilation. It takes a lot of time because the, the compiler has to do many, many optimizations to make the code run fast, and these optimizations take time. So the idea of tier compilation is to have different levels of compilers. So as soon as the, um, the browser uh, receives some WebAssembly files, it will, it will pass them to a basic compiler. Every browser has a different one, whatever, let's call it like this for now. That will very quickly um, ship to the browser um, a compiled version of the file without all the optimization. If you're familiar with just-in-time compilers, it's like kind of the same principle that we had for like warm code, hot code, and all that stuff. And the app will start to run, and on the background, the optimizing compiler will receive again the WebAssembly files and compile an even faster version of the program. And as soon as this is ready, and your app is already running, so you're not waiting, it will switch them. Uh, so this uh, can have a, a huge gain in startup time and in like overall performance. And good news too, it's shipped in most of the browsers too. Um, we have ref the, even uh, WebKit has an article on that. Uh, so you can expect it to work it kind of everywhere. Uh, yeah, uh, WebKit compiles, they are called Oh My God and Barbecue. <laughs> You can check the articles yourself. And the um, last one is uh, about implicit, uh, implicit HTTP caching. Because uh, as we said, web one very cool feature of WebAssembly is that it's predictable. So one web and files will all the time compile to the same uh, machine code. That means that browser would be able to use the HTTP cache to cache the compiled version instead of the, of the file they received. So, when actually your application runs again and you request a WASM file, if the browser has already a compiled version of it, it will directly do the trade-off. And you will have no compilation step at all. That's a work in progress and there are some articles, but it's, it's hard to get where they are. Like there's a op bug open on Bugzilla since a long time in Brazil. Uh, last thing, uh, it's about modules. So it's about like, kind of what we saw already in the previous talk. So the goal of WebAssembly is not just to compile an entire huge app like AutoCAD and bring it to the browser. It can be even used to like um, develop a very heavy computational um, library that does some like specific task and use it in your JS app. Um, so one improvement that was a bottleneck years ago is the speed of the codes between the JavaScript environment and the WebAssembly one. Uh, there's an article from Mozilla where they showed that finally now it's, it's doable and really in the past was the uh, bottleneck because uh, back in the days, three years ago now, it's like, yeah, it was uh, summer 2017, I had made a talk at Brazil.js, uh, it was an experiment of WebAssembly testing really the first shipped version of the MVP and we actually end up seeing that the WebAssembly version was quite slower than a web worker implementation. And the issue was exactly that. Like in Firefox and in Chrome, it was every time you were calling a method of your WebAssembly file from JavaScript and the other way around, it was slow. Like the just in time compiler didn't know well how to deal it. Now this is fast, at least in Firefox, but in Chrome too it's fast. Um, about that exchange too, we saw in the first talk, second talk, how painful it is right now like to pass data between your uh, WebAssembly module and your JS apps. You have to deal with pointers and a lot of very headache stuff if, you, if you're not used to, to these kind of things. Um, in the future, we will be able uh, to pass directly objects, which is what is like the first class citizens in, uh, in the JavaScript world will become a kind of first class citizens in the WebAssembly world. Today. And it's an implementation kind of like a Last thing, uh, it's about ES modules integration. Uh, we didn't dive deeper on how you actually, or we did, whatever, maybe I lost it, uh, how you load a WebAssembly module, but you're using, a, you're using an imperative API. So you have to fetch the file from your JavaScript, load it, pass the array buffer, and all this stuff. This uh, causes one thing, that the WebAssembly module is not directly part of the JavaScript module tree. And this has some limitations inside of like uh, how you want to load your stuff. So when this will ship, uh, you will be able to, to, to do stuff like running, adding to your HTML script, type module, point to a WebAssembly resource. And one more thing, 
uh, I don't have that uh, turtle neck thing because it's crazy hot. Um, but the first question, that, no, kind of the first question that was asked today was, what if we want to run WebAssembly out of in something which is not the browser? Uh, so yeah, the question was that. Is WebAssembly only useful in the browsers? Um, well, the browser is useful by itself. Why? The browsers allow you an easy, easy way to port your code. You write your JavaScript script, gets shipped on the web, runs on every machine, and it's secure. For what we mean secure, like kind of low level security. Uh, it's a sandboxed environment. You're not giving access to the script to your, like, the memory on your machine. Like, uh, they will not delete or your hard drive, or whatever. Um, so you may think, yeah, there's already something that does this, and it's Node.js. Um, what? It already allows me to run JavaScript on a server, wherever I want, and it's kind of secure. Uh, well, it's kind of portable, too, and kind of secure, because um, Node.js, uh, it's the de facto standard for whenever you want to run JavaScript outside of the browser. But it's a de facto standard. It's not a standard. There's not an official W3C organization behind it. Um, and in terms of security, uh, when Node.js launched, they had to choose either to give an easy API to access your files on the, browser, uh, on the machine or to ship a, a very layered security level. They went for the first one. Like, it's very easy to access files on, on Node.js, and these are the implications in security. Um, so it's very cool that uh, the WebAssembly working group forked and kind of forked and developed a new, a new interface, which is called WASI. And WASI stands for WebAssembly System Interface. And you can see it as a kind of standardized version of Node.js without the implementation. So WASI, it's about telling how a WebAssembly environment out of the browser should work, how the, the API to access the file should work. But it will not say this is the software you have to install. So every you can we can have many implementation of, Web, of Wasi, but it will be a standard. So if your ap application is compatible with this, it will run in any system that implements an engine of this. Okay, clear, kind of good. Uh, so that will be an, an entire different talk, very long. There are like a lot of interesting stuff on this. I just uh, put you some links if you're interested to check it out. And that's it. So we saw that there are many things coming. Uh, WebAssembly is not uh, the MVP. It's a living standard that just started to really grow fast. Because now the MVP was to validate. Like, the, the, as the word, the, the need for something like this, does it work? Stamp of approval. Now we have like many, many features shipping. And as I showed you in the beginning, it's quite straightforward, quite easy to, to, to get into the process. Like, uh, it's not that uh, there are so many WebAssembly developers or like the community is that big. It's quite accessible. Uh, so you have a very good chance to join the ride and like do interesting things. Merci. That's my Twitter where I post like one thing per year. If you're lucky, it's interesting content maybe once per year. On va prendre quelques questions. Mais en français aussi, tu parles français, mais la la place est en anglais. Go. I have a question regarding uh, the compatibility of the feature you, uh, mm -hmm. you showed us, uh, because uh, uh, let's say one browser uh, supports one feature, how about how you gonna deal with them? Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, you mean, uh, so the question is like about like supporting different browsers at a different level for the same features, if I got it. And yeah. how you actually degrade it gracefully if yeah. the feature is not supported. Is there any polyphile system or...? Uh, there is a polyphile system. Polyphile system um, is just that uh, depends. For example, as I showed you, like for exceptions, there's a polyphile provided uh, kind of as part of the standard. Uh, otherwise, it really depends. It's a little bit blurry right now. Uh, the suggestion is that um, if the feature is not standardized, then it may change. So, for example, right now, Google Chrome already supports uh, WebAssembly threads and launched a big app like uh, Google Heart, all based on this. But it's not standard yet, so they, they're taking a risk. It may be that the API changes slightly, and they will have to adapt to that. Yeah, but even if uh, the API is uh, standardized, 
how does the implementation, because the implementation will be not uh, equals uh, in terms of the browser. Uh, yeah, like uh, you, you will have like, like you do for JavaScript feature to check if the feature is actually there yeah. in your code. And if not, fall back to something that works. Or if you support on. <laughs> Yeah, like for example, as I showed you, like if you open the, the Vim editor porting on Firefox, mm -hmm. it will tell you, I see that shared array buffers are not enabled and I cannot enable WASM thread. Please turn on the flag and reload the page. Uh, not ideal, but it's... Uh, anyway, like uh, WebAssembly support, it's really for modern browsers now, so like the kind of... For now, you don't have really to worry to support many, many different versions. They're kind of all aligned. And um, the, the, there's like an a part of the article on the Google Heart uh, project actually makes a comparison on what features are supported on Safari, Firefox, Chrome, and which decision the team took to, to address this. And the, the outcome is that for now, they're kind of there. Like, uh, the differences between browser engines, at least the most popular, are not that big. So hopefully it will stay like this. This, as we saw in the first talk, it's like a community effort for real this time. So the browser engines are really like into like making the standard go in a normal way, like without having some feature discrepancy too big. Plus Edge will pass on Chromium soon. Other question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, for now, that's not in the list of the upcoming features. Oh, then there's like, a, if you have an interest in the WebSockets, like, um, and you think that it's like WebAssembly should introduce some support. Uh, I, in the beginning of the slide, when I was explaining all the whatever, uh, <laughs> I was explaining all the process, there's a link to the design uh, repository in GitHub, and you can literally open an issue there or check if there are already some issues opened on that. And the work in progress right now, they have at least at like 20 features working on right now, so they're a little bit packed, but for the future, it's like you can really open an issue, like uh, without a solution, that's cool. <laughs> Not me, like last last time, uh, last approach with me and QT was a long time ago. So <laughs> I don't know if I will, but yet. But that can be interesting, like to, to check it out. Like uh, then you can send me the, the the link and I can add it to the slide if you want. So since it's something very like that, as you said, this shit a couple of days ago. Une dernière question. On mange. <laughs> Allez. <laughs> ah, ah. It's not my fault. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that, uh, like the, the one thing, um, the two features are like the having multiple compilers, it's tiered compilation, and having the file compiled on the go, it's streaming compilation. Streaming compilation is something that in some browsers right now you can request through the, the WebAssembly APIs when you load a file. So you can have like a load streaming file, something like this, and you can force it. Uh, for the tiering compilation, it's something internal of the browser engine, so it's, it's for now I think it's really up to the browser heuristics to understand what's the best thing to apply. Like it, it's it's kind of one need to, to, to force yeah, so the, 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 the just-in-time compiler to, to compile uh, all your code like if we were of, of code. We, that's, depends, depends, I think that's, uh, I, 
hard to tell. Like it, we will have to open the code of V8 and then start to see. Uh, but it may be that V8 sees that if the bandwidth is uh, slow or fast enough, it can already start to compile with like an optimizing compiler, and it's it's up to the browser engine really. Merci. Allez, on mange. <laughs>